May the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My dear friends, he slept alone out in the wilderness. He lived by his own wits and the strength of his hands, eating only that which he could catch and kill for himself. He depended on no one but himself. In fact, no one told him where to go or what to do or what he should think or anything about where he should be from one day to the next. If he was lucky, he might make a fortune selling furs. If he was lucky, he might discover new places on the frontier and win for himself such glory and honor among men. He was living free. Then again, he probably wasn't going to be living very long. It was a hard life. And while we might look back with a little bit of romantic attitude towards that frontier life and living off on your own and driving your own path, and we here out in Oregon do reap the benefits of those people who braved the wilderness, that was no way to live your life. It felt like freedom, but freedom doesn't really come when you're hungry and scared, when a grizzly bear may attack you in the middle of nowhere or hostile natives may take your scalp. Even back then, it was better to be in a frontier village or town. It was way better to be in a city where there were people to help defend you and provide for your needs. Being on your own always sounds so attractive. But in reality, that's a hard life. David found himself a little bit on his own. Or at least he thought he was on his own. And when he found himself on his own, he found out that this wasn't working the way it was supposed to. But he also found this. Even when he had wandered away and gone off all by himself into a dangerous place, he wasn't really alone. The Lord was with him. And today, as we look at the world around us and it seems like things might be falling apart and all the stuff that makes us feel secure feel like they might be going a little bit away, and we begin to feel like we might be alone, we rejoice to hear David's words, David's encouragement to strengthen us that the Lord camps with his people. Like many of the psalms. This psalm comes when David was on the run. He was running from Saul and things were starting to escalate. Then David had an idea. He knew where he could go. He had a plan someplace where Saul would never dream of finding him. He went to Philistia. He went to the city of Gath. You might know the name of one of the soldiers from that city, a certain Goliath, whose sword, by the way, David had just started carrying on his own side. He went into that city, and this was at a time when the hit song in Israel was Saul had killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And there David goes, wandering, searching for security in the land of Philistia, only to be surprised that they didn't really want him there. He realized his mistake very quickly. And so he pretended to be mad. He started drawing symbols on the walls, babbling and drooling down his beard, and they sent him out of that place. Get this crazy man away. Things didn't go as David planned. Vacation is ruined, Dad thought. They had a whole itinerary planned for the next two weeks, and car trouble wasn't on the list. But while Dad worried about that and waited for, how the co- for someone to come and get the car fixed, 
Well, the children went down to the nearby creek. While Dad fretted, they searched for agates. They chased frogs. They splashed and jumped on the rocks and had a good time. And when they were starting to get a little tired, they walked up to the car and they found that there was water and snacks for them to have there. For years to come, they would say, that was one of the best days of vacation ever. They were laughing and happy. Not a care in the world. Because all that trouble, that was in Dad's hands. And because dad was taking care of it, they had more than enough room for joy. Who's going to figure out your situation, your life, your future, your trouble, or your success? Just as it doesn't do a kid to worry about how the car is going to get fixed, that's for dad to worry about. And just as children, especially young children, just implicitly trust their dad to figure it out and they can find joy all in the world around them, so also David says, I will praise the Lord at all times. And he doesn't just mean once the trouble has passed. He doesn't say I will praise the Lord once I'm no longer in this situation, when everything turns out to be okay. He means at all times, in the worst times, in the stickiest situations, the humble will hear and rejoice. It was in the moment that David realized that he was powerless, that he had only made things worse, that he could do nothing to fix things. It was in that moment that David said, I will rejoice in the Lord always. Because David found, even when he had wandered far from home, when he had wandered far from his people, far from the tabernacle, far from common sense, Even when David had wandered off by himself, there the Lord was with him. Even there, the angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him. And so David invites us today, proclaim the greatness of the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. No matter where you are, no matter how grave the circumstance, no matter how foolish we have been, our lives, our future It is still in God's hands. It is still in his care. And as long as we are in the Lord's camp, he's got it. And so we've got joy. Maybe we look at the situation and we think finding security with your bitterest enemies was a first guess bad idea. But David was thinking this is just crazy enough to work. He had it all figured out. We too like to have it all figured out. A plan and a contingency plan so we know just what to do when trouble comes. We make our financial plans, our savings and investments to secure our future. We strengthen and train our bodies. We buy equipment that makes us feel safe. We read all the studies and say and follow the advice of the experts so we know how to live and what to do we have a government to protect us even from ourselves a social safety net to catch us when we stumble and none of those ideas are nearly as harebrained as david's plan was in fact we might say those are all good things and all good ideas but are any of them a place where we can put our trust This week, the story of Afghanistan has been inescapable. We can't take our eyes off that tragedy. The Afghan people trusted the United States to have their backs and to keep them safe. And why shouldn't they have? Why wouldn't they? The most powerful nation on earth promised to be there. And they saw for themselves, they saw our guns, our vehicles, our choppers, our drones, our planes, our bombs, our surveillance, our soldiers, our training. I could go on and on. How could that possibly let them down? And indeed, it didn't. Not for 20 years at least. And then, just like that, in less than a month, 
it all crumbled. It's not my place to comment too much on global politics. And who am I to say what should have been done? But I think we have to recognize even the great, even the seemingly invincible might of the United States military didn't or couldn't keep its promise of safety. And if we can't trust that power, where can we put our trust? Where can we feel secure? And I think that is possibly one of the most important questions we can really ask ourselves. For when we put our trust in anything, that is anything or anyone other than where it belongs, we will always find ourselves living in fear, real fear. What if I'm not as smart as I think I am? What if my plans fall? What if my money runs out or the markets crash or inflation skyrockets? What if my body grows weak or my equipment fails me? What if leadership lets me down or the government collapses? Or what if they simply just don't do what they promised they would? Or worse than that, what if the beast of the sea turns his teeth, his horns, his many heads against you? Misplaced trust leaves us with no place safe to lay down our heads. When we build our own camps or live and dwell in the camps of those who do not love us and do not fear the Lord, we will not be secure. This poor man called and the Lord heard. From all his distress, the Lord saved him. Where can we put our trust. Jesus, the rider on the white horse, has ridden over his enemies. As we see in our gospel lesson, he does all things well. He even makes the deaf to hear. He opens the eyes of the blind. It is his foot that has crushed the serpent's head, his blood which washes away every sin. He buries death and brings victory to life. Every word Jesus has spoken, that he has done. His, he commands his angels concerning you. His presence goes ahead of you. His power is at your rear guard. He never retreats. He never loses focus. The one who watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. And when we put our trust in him, we never be, need to be afraid that somewhere down the line he's going to change his mind. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when he says your sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. When he promises the kingdom of heaven belongs to you, no one can take it away because the angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him, those who put their trust, their faith, who look on the Lord in awe. He delivers them. Now, when David was in deep trouble, I doubt he was thinking about all these big, deep thoughts. In fact, usually when you're in trouble, you're only thinking about that moment, that hour, that day. Clothing and shoes, food and drink, house, home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all I own and all I need to keep my body and life. With those words, Luther describes that hierarchy of needs that you may have learned in school 400 years before anyone wrote those words, hierarchy of needs. Without our basic needs being met, nothing else really seems to matter. When we struggle for the basic things of life, a human being can't really flourish. But we in our modern world have trouble believing what Luther wrote before that, that God still cares for me by richly and daily providing all those things. You see, we are convinced that it's my own hard work that puts money in my pocket and food on the table. That Jeff Bezos not only sends rockets into space, but he drops nice little packages at my door. And when food is so abundant 
and so easy to buy and cheap to purchase that we don't even think about it when we have to throw things away. With everything being so plentiful, it's hard for us to realize the blessing of staying in the Lord's camp. Nutritional studies are often poorly done and nearly impossible to replicate, so I have a personal philosophy on things regarding nutrition. I only believe the studies that I like for myself. It's very helpful. One such study was on artificial flavors. And in it, they figured out that our body has natural systems that tend to crave the nutrients which we actually need. Sometimes you find kids eating foods they didn't think they liked. It's because their bodies know that's what I need. It's why pickles taste so good after a hot and sweaty day and why we crave the citrus fruits full of vitamin C during cold and flu season. But when you use artificial flavors, they're designed to mimic all of those good nutrients that you want and your body craves, but they give none of them. For some, this explains why you can't stop eating those chips or those fruity candies, why those diet sodas don't actually help any of us lose any weight. Artificial flavors keep us eating, but they never feed us. Our world surrounds us with artificial flavors, but its pleasures never satisfy. The deepest depths of its wisdom never truly refresh us. Yet the more we seem to take those things in, the more we tend to crave them. But David says, not for those who dwell in the Lord's camp. Just as the best cure for craving sweets is the true sweetness of some fresh fruit, and the best way to curb your hunger is with savory herbs and some good healthy protein, so also David reminds us we have something better than all the sweets and the artificial things of the world. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him. Outside the Lord's camp, people are always searching and always starving. A young lion may lack food and be hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Just as the Apostle Paul has taught us, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us all good things? And so even when we don't have all that we want, even when it seems like God can't provide what we need, as long as we have him, his love, his presence, his hand watching and his eye watching over us, his kingdom, as long as we are connected to him and in his camp, we will never lack his best things. Now David never imagined his life would turn like this. He, when he was anointed king, this isn't quite what he had in mind. When he entered the courts of King Saul and became one of Saul's generals, this wasn't the training he was having. He didn't have instructions for life like this. I think we have all had that feeling that uh, they didn't train me for this. I know I've heard pastors say, they didn't cover that at the seminary. Or, I'm sure you've thought this, they didn't teach me that in school. The quadratic equation doesn't really help you out when your boss is yelling at you and you're overtired. I don't even know if the quadratic equation helps you file your taxes we sometimes entertain the thought that we can teach enough and prepare someone enough that they will have everything they could possibly want or need for all that life can throw at them. And if they don't have that information, then it means education has somehow failed. When kids decide what they want to be when they grow up, we lay out all the steps they need to take so that they can get there. But life, is often much more challenging. There are often steps you didn't know were coming. And many graduate college and are terrified to find out that there isn't a next step there waiting for them. And that little bit of freedom is paralyzing. 
David asks, who wants to find pleasure in life? Who would love to experience many good days? Well, who wouldn't, right, David? Then we might expect a detailed list of instructions on what to eat, when to wake up, how to make your bed, how much to exercise, what education to pursue, when to start a family, and so on and so forth, just like we find in all of those self-help books and those gurus that we listen to in our daily life. But instead, David's instructions are short and simple. Guard your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. Can it really be that simple? David can't possibly believe it's that easy. Not while he has jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire and found he didn't like the fire and so he jumped back into the frying pan again. But David says, yes, come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I will teach you what it is, what it looks like to dwell in the Lord's camp. In the Lord's camp, we know that we lack no good thing. We know that the Lord will protect us. We know that salvation comes from the Lord. We know that God has it all under control. And so life is this simple. Flee evil. Pursue the good. In the Lord's camp, we don't have to earn his favor. We don't have to earn the approval of the world around us. We don't have to earn even our own approval. There is nothing we need to do for our salvation. So you have the freedom instead to pursue a good life in the Lord. And so you always have good things to do. Seek the good of your neighbor. Pursue the good of your neighbor, your community, God's world. Do good, seek peace, and pursue it. I like to read about those adventurers who went off on their own and found great things out there in that wide world. But I don't know that I would like to do that myself. I love my nation as much as anyone. I cherish the freedoms we have, the goal of liberty that unites us. I love living in this state with all it offers, and I'm thankful to be blessed to be a part of this community. But at the same time, I recognize that this is not my camp. This is not where we belong. This world is not our home. Our home is with the Lord. And so even when we feel alone, when we feel like the community around us is no longer someplace safe and secure, we have something better. The Lord camps with us as we travel through this wilderness. Even when we take wrong turns, the Lord watches over you. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears listen to their cry. And so in a world full of sin and hardship, when we need a safe place to stay, we have a permanent tribe, a fort, a camp, a home, a city which will never fall. When life is hard and uncertain, we are blessed to be in the Lord's camp. For the Lord redeems the souls of his servants. And in that promise, we can trust forever. Please rise as we hear the words of Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. The Lord, In the Lord my soul will boast. The humble will hear and rejoice. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord with me. And let us exult in his name forever. I sought the Lord and he answered me. From all my terrors he delivered me. His people look to him and are radiant. Their faces will never blush. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. And all, from all of his distress, the Lord saved him. The angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you saints, since those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions may lack food and be hungry. 
but those who seek the Lord do not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to my voice, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who wants to find pleasure in life? Who would love to experience many good days? Guard your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord watch over the righteous. His ears listen to their cry. The face of the Lord is set against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. From all their distress he delivers them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those whose spirits have been crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He watches over all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous will be found guilty. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. Anyone who takes refuge in him will not be found guilty. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.